in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation this morning. May God bless all of you in a very special way. So as we start our conversation, as always, we invite one, one of the most preeminent members in our family to be with us. We invite to be with us the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary has many titles. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. But also Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. So let's uh, invite Mary to be with us as we say the prayer. Prayer that uh, Mary loves most. And that prayer is the Hail Mary together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we'd like to invite to be with us, of course, our spiritual guide. We really don't know how to pray as we ought. So we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. The Holy Spirit is known as a paraclete. He's also known as the gift of gifts. The Holy Spirit is known also as the our counselor. He's also known as our consoler. He's also known as our sanctifier. He's also known as the finger of God. And also the Holy Spirit is very important because we don't know how to pray as we ought. St. Paul says we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans, so we can say, we can say Abba. You know what Abba means? It means Daddy or Father. So I invite all of you to pray with me to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will give us a lot of light in our intellect and the fire of divine love in our hearts, so that we'll be able to live out the greatest of all commandments, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Together, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord, Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So we welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. So as a note of, note of encouragement, I would like to once again offer my prayers for all of you and these prayers will be offered by means of opus day i like to call opus day is the work of god and that refers to the greatest opus day which is the holy sacrifice of the mass as always i pray the mass every day so in the mass that i'll be praying today I'll place all of you on the altar. I'll place all of you in on the paten, in the chalice. 
so that when I lift up the patent, when I lift up the chalice, I'll be lifting you up to God. Once again, I'd like to offer three special intentions. One will be for our personal sanctification. Our personal sanctification means that we're, we're all called to become saints. Jesus said, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. I'd like to pray that we all pursue a life of holiness. And as the founder of Opus Dei, Jose Maria Escobar Balaguer says that the biggest crisis in the world is the lack of saints. The only way in which we're going to be changing this world is by trying to really pursue the reason for our existence. That is our holiness of life. My second intention will be I'd like to pray for your family and your children. These weeks, in general, are weeks of vacation from school. And these weeks can be vacation for the children, but more work for the parents. I say it could be vacation for the children, but maybe more work for the parents. I invite all of you to try to get your children involved, not to give in to laziness, but let them maybe rest a little bit more, but possibly daily mass. Get them to do some type of physical work. Engage them in sports. Encourage them to do good reading, to cultivate their minds. Encourage them to maybe cultivate some type of hobby. Painting, writing, singing, music. Encourage them to also cultivate maybe good friendships. Good friend is a, is a pearl of infinite price. But the vacation weeks are not time of just giving into laziness. But basically, recreation means to recreate. To recreate our energies so that we can return to more arduous work, which would be that of our studies, once the break is over. So I'd like to pray for you as well as for your children that these would not be days or weeks of wasted time, but implemented well on a human, supernatural intellectual, social level, the cultivating of the human person in his totality. <laughs> My last uh, intention will be that all of us will have a desire to pray more. One suggestion to help us in our prayer life before we go to the, the topic of the day is this. It's called the principle of motivation in psychology. The principle of motivation is this. We're not going to undertake any enterprise or initiative worthy of its name if we're not motivated. If we don't have a sincere, honest motiva motivation, we're never going to do anything any carry out any noble enterprise. So what I'm saying related to prayer in our holy hour and our spiritual life, unless we're really convinced in our mind as to the real importance of this activity, we're not going to carry it out. Our will is not going to be motivated. So I invite all of you to uh, to do some good reading on prayer. We're going through the catechism a number at a time, and I haven't had enough time to explain the numbers individually. 
However, it has to be said that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the fourth part of this spiritual masterpiece is totally dedicated to prayer. Totally dedicated to prayer. Totally. And this dedication to prayer, written by a commission supervised by John Paul II, speak to us, speaks to us about what prayer is, but how important prayer is. Our conversion, our sanctification, our perseverance in holiness, and the sanctification of those who are entrusted to us depends upon our union with God. And we're united with God through the sacramental life, no doubt about it, but also we're united to God by means of a deep prayer life. Father Thomas Dubé, of Happy Memory, has written several books on prayer. Fire Within, Prayer Primer. He also wrote another book that he actually presented at a retreat in Alhambra a few years back. The name of the book was Deep Prayer or Deep Conversion. What Father Thomas Dubé was trying to point out was that we want to arrive at a deep conversion. We have to go deeper in our prayer life. So let's make a concerted effort to pray more and better. This will become a reality, I sincerely believe, once we fill our minds with the noble thoughts of prayer. Filling our minds with the noble thoughts of prayer. So there's our, my prayer intentions for your sanctification, for your children, and for your motivation in your prayer life. Okay, my friends, we're, we're arriving at the last week in which we'll be talking about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So uh, next week at this time, we'll already be into the month of July. So the catechesis I'd like to give on the Sacred Heart of Jesus today is simply this. During the course of the day, try to think about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Try to think about his great love for you in between activities. Think about how much he really does love you, and it's very true. And say this prayer often during the day. Sacred Heart of Jesus, I trust in you. Sacred Heart of Jesus, I trust in you. If you see in the background in my studio that beautiful picture, painting, of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Never forget that your two essential places of refuge have to be the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So there's our brief catechesis on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Be aware of the presence of the Sacred Heart of Jesus during the course of the day, and talk to him often. Talk to him as your best friend. All right, a brief summary of yesterday. Yesterday, my friends, we celebrated the birthday of St. John the Baptist. What a great saint. We actually celebrate his feast day twice a year. We celebrate his birthday on June 24th. Then we celebrate his passion and death on August 29th. Very rarely does the church celebrate the birth and death of of a saint. Obviously, we do that with, with Jesus. But on John the Baptist, there's much that can be said. Jesus says, of all men born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. One of the hallmarks 
or highlights of the greatness of John the Baptist was his profound humility. Maybe as we finish up talking about John the Baptist, pray that we will grow in humility. Humility, it's not an easy virtue to grow in. And it's not always easy to understand what does it mean to be humble. But John the Baptist teaches us humility is placing God always first in your life. If God is the center of your life, he's the very center of your life, then you will be humble. And that's what John the Baptist did. He said about Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. He also said, I'm nothing more than a voice crying out the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. He said that I am the friend of the bridegroom. Once the bridegroom comes, I disappear. Also, John the Baptist expressed this very humbling statement. I am not the one. I am not the great prophet. I am not worthy of him. And he said about his relationship to Jesus Christ that he's not even worthy to untie or unfasten the sandal strap for Jesus Christ. To understand that concept, in the time of Jesus, the most extended social class would be that of the slaves. Slave in Greek would be the word duro, would do hard things and dirty things. And household would have slaves. One of the obligations of the slave would be when a guest would come, he would take off their sandals and wash their feet. So John the Baptist was actually creating an, uh, a social class that did not exist for himself, related to Jesus Christ. And that was, he went on to say, that I'm not even worthy to be a slave in comparison with Jesus Christ. I am lower than a slave. What profound humility. For that reason, Jesus said, of all men born of women, none was greater than John the Baptist. And then John the Baptist was forming the super apostles, Andrew and John, most likely Peter and James, the pillars of the church. They're being formed by John the Baptist. On one occasion, you can read this in John chapter 1, John the Baptist was with a couple of his disciples. Jesus was walking in front of them. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And his disciples, Andrew and John, the beloved disciple, got up and they left John the Baptist. John the Baptist did not say, After you spend the afternoon with him, come back and I'll see you tomorrow. He did not cling any person, place, or thing except Jesus Christ. He was always trying to point to Jesus Christ, as we should do. He was a, a signpost. He was an indicator, pointing to Jesus Christ, as I'm trying to do, and as you should try to do. And finally, one of the most important moments In the life of John the Baptist related to Jesus himself was the time, the moment of the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. Imagine Jesus there arriving at the Jordan River. There are many people there. Why are there many people there? Not so much because of the Jordan River, but because of the holiness of the person that was baptizing. And that person was John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist. When Jesus gets in line, he arrives at John the Baptist. John the Baptist in humility says, Lord, I should be baptized by you. And you come to me. Jesus says, let it be so that we accomplish justice. So John the Baptist, obedient to Jesus and to the will of the Heavenly Father, he allows Jesus to descend into the Jordan River and he baptizes him. There we see a Trinitarian theophany. We hear the voice of God the Father, Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We see the second person, Jesus, descending into the water, thereby sanctifying the waters that will be used to baptize all afterward. Then we see a symbolic depiction of the Holy Spirit, the dove that alights over Jesus Christ, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So my friends, we're just finishing up the person of St. John the Baptist. We celebrate his nativity or birthday every year, June 24th. One last closing comment. There are many virtues that we can highlight with respect to John the Baptist, but the one I'm trying to emphasize today is the importance of his great humility. As earlier in an earlier talk I said, the Catechism of the Catholic Church points out that the communion of saints can help us because they can pray for us. But the saints serve as a powerful witness of holiness. We should try to emulate and imitate and walk in their steps. So we're going to pray that we grow in humility. Even though this is hard to listen to and to understand and to assimilate, much less to put into practice, but it has to be said that humility in our lives, one of the means or the roads that the Lord chooses to help us to grow in humility is through humiliations. I know what I'm saying is very difficult. St. Ignatius of Loyola in one of his meditations called the three grades of humility. First, we, 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 we want to die before committing a mortal sin. We want to get mortal sin out of our life totally then we don't want to give in to deliberate venial sin. After mortal sin, our, our worst enemy is deliberate venial sin. As Teresa of Avila says, God save us from a nun that would say it's only a venial sin. Even though we are weak, we're fall, we have to be fighting against sin in our lives. The book of Hebrews says we have not resisted to the point of shedding blood yet in resisting sin. But the third degree of humility of St. Ignatius is a willingness to even suffer humiliations for Christ. And of course our example is Jesus Christ, especially in his passion. Every different detail of the passion of Christ was a manifestation of great humility. Whether we like it or not, my friends, Humiliations are going to come our way. The most frequent place of humiliation is in our home among our family members. Many ways we can be humiliated. By being ignored, maybe. By being snubbed. By being interrupted in conversation by a family member letting us up, by a harsh word by a family member, by being subjected to selfishness by a family member. There are a million and one ways in which 
we can be humiliated in our family. So we want to try to overcome becoming angry and bitter and resentful. But to accept our humiliations, unite them to the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Don't forget, every time I say Mass, or any priest celebrates Mass, it is Calvary once again. All the fruits of Calvary on Good Friday can are applied in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So there we have it. Let's move then, my friends, into the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, my friends, we are meditating upon this first book of the Bible. And all this week we've been meditating upon Abram who today, his, his name is changed from Abram to Abraham. We've already covered Abram leaving Ur, his home, going to a foreign land, obedient to God. Abraham is 75 years of age. We see Abraham progressing in age. We see Abram traveling with his nephew Lot. Both Abram's family and Lot's family are very, very rich. And a consequence of these two men having a lot of riches, there's a lot of struggles and fights and quarrels among their servants. So Abram tells Lot that it's best for them to separate. Whatever direction Lot would go, Abraham would go the other direction. So Lot chooses the fertile land of the Jordan, which will end up near Sodom and Gomorrah. Abram will head toward Cana. So we see Abram and his wife Sarai progressing, moving on. Today we've got chapter 17 in the book of Genesis. And Abram is now Abraham. He's no longer 75 years of age. He's 99. He's 99 years of age. He's almost 100. And the Lord appears to him and talks to him. I'd like to just take one concept, one verse, one idea at a time. God appears to him and talks to him. God wants to talk to you. God wants to talk to you. The interesting thing about prayer is that prayer, in a certain sense, is the easiest thing in the world, but it's the most difficult thing in the world. I'll explain. Prayer is the easiest thing in the world in this sense. That prayer, which is what we see between Abraham and God, is it's conversation with God. It's dialogue with God. It's communication with God. It's the easiest in the sense that we can pray. We can communicate with God. In any time, in any place, in any circumstance, using any language, at any length, it can be a short prayer, it can be a holy hour, it can be a day of prayer. And every day, every time, 
that we open up our heart to God in humility, sincerity, purity of heart. God always has his ears attentive to our supplications, always. In other words, what I'm really saying is the following, that God is never too busy for us. Even though there are seven to eight billion people in the world, God is never too busy for us. However, we often are too busy for God. How ironic. I repeat that God is never too busy for us. But we, our busy schedules, are too busy for God. It shouldn't be that way. Because God is God. We would not even exist if God did not bring us into existence. Even the fact that we live, the theologians say, is a constant creation in which God is maintaining us in existence. If he took away our breath, we'd be dead in a few minutes. If he stopped our heartbeat, we'd be dead. God brought us into existence. God maintains us. God sustains us. And God loves us. So that's the interesting thing in prayer is that God is never too busy for us. But we at times are too busy for him. Therefore, we should always make that concerted effort to give the Lord an hour every day. Make sure that you're faithful to your holy hour, as Fulton Sheen says, the hour of power. So those are just tuning into our conversation. We're talking about the readings of the Mass. And this week we've been going through the uh, first book of the Bible, Genesis, which we encounter Abram, whose name is changed to Abraham, and Sarai, whose name will be changed to Sarah. Let's move on with the biblical passage. Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 17 today. It says, God said, I am God the Almighty. What does that mean? I am God the Almighty. Another translation might be the omnipotent. Spanish, omnipotente todo poderoso, if you speak Spanish. God is almighty. God is all powerful. And one of the numbers of the diary of St. Faustina Kowalska, which I have here, here's the diary. Jesus says that one way in which we can draw close to God in prayer is by meditating upon the attributes of God. I repeat, one way in which we can draw close to God, go deeper in our prayer life, is by meditating upon the attributes of God. In that number, Jesus wanted Faustina to highlight three attributes. And those three attributes that he highlighted that number were the holiness of God, then the justice of God, then the mercy of God. Those are three of the attributes of God which describe who God is. In the first reading today, we have God is almighty. God is all powerful. If you like to go deeper into that word almighty, 
you can reflect upon the creation account earlier in the same book that we're going through. It's called the creation account of Genesis, which God is creating out of nothing. That's the nature of creation is God brings from nothing God brings into existence. God creates the majestic mountains. God is almighty. God creates the immense, vast expanse of the seas and the oceans. God is almighty. God creates the whales and the sea monsters as they're described in the book of Psalms. God is almighty. God creates the elephants, the rhinoceros, the giraffes. God, indeed, is almighty. God can do everything. And God can do everything. God does everything perfectly and immediately. Simply to say something in the Bible, for God to say something means it already exists. So relating this to prayer, St. Alphonsus Liguori who's written extensively on so many topics, goes on to point out that there's not, some, there's not so much a weak person or a strong person, but a person that prays and a person that doesn't pray. What St. Alphonse is pointing out related to God being almighty is the following. If we are men and women of deep prayer, we might have health issues, we might be limited in intelligence, we might have family problems, but if we sincerely have a life of prayer, then we are strong. Why? Because our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. earth. Because God is our strength. He's our fortress. He's our rock. He's our support. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. If God is with us, who could be against us? My grace is sufficient, as Jesus says to St. Paul, who asked him to deliver him from the thorn in the flesh. So may God be your strength today. That's why we insist so much upon our prayer life. If you have, my friends, a... If you have a deep prayer life, if you really take your prayer life seriously, then God will send you his grace and his strength. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So let's move on. Following verse is a verse we can spend a lot of time on. This verse really struck me last night and this morning. Don't forget that God is speaking to Abraham. And he says, Walk in my presence. Walk in my presence. The two ideas, walk in my presence 
and be blameless. Wow. Let's talk about that. Walk in my presence and be blameless. St. Teresa of Avila, a woman doctor of the church, made her doctor of the church was St. Catherine of Siena in 1970 by St. Pope Paul VI. They said this, that one of the principal reasons why we commit sin is because we become oblivious toward or we forget the presence of God. I repeat, Teresa of Avila, a woman doctor of the church, points out this fact. One of the principal reasons why we commit sin is we forget the presence of God. And then we give in to our own passions, our desires, and we allow the devil to dictate what, you, what we should be doing. So this could be one of our points for reflection for all of us today in our pursuit of holiness is today try in as much as is possible. Try to live in the presence of God. Not saying it's easy, but try to live in the presence of God. Live in the presence of God. There's a book written by Brother Lawrence. And his book is Living in the Presence of God. And he said that that's the key to holiness. We forget about God, we don't call upon God, then we we fall flat on our face, which is another way for saying we fall into sin. And one way in which we can do this is to have some God reminders. What do I mean I mean by God reminders? Having God reminders, a couple weeks ago I was on Relevant Radio with Josh Ryan and he wanted to talk about sacramentals. We had a very good conversation for an hour on Relevant Radio. So utilizing sacramentals is a good way to, these are called God reminders. Have your rosary in your pocket. Make sure that you wear your scapular. Make sure that you have holy pictures of Jesus and the saints. When you're traveling in your car, have an image of Jesus, the Sacred Heart, Divine Mercy, an image of Mary, St. Joseph. If you're a homemaker, I'm sure you're, you're, you already have this, but be aware of the, of the statues of the saints, of the paintings of the saints, of the crucifix on the wall, of the image of Our Lady Guadalupe, the image of the Sacred Heart, in other words, what I'm saying, my friends, is that if we have these God reminders, these are called, I call these God reminders, then they are conduits or means by which we elevate our mind to God. And another definition for prayer, which we find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church from St. John Damascene, he says, prayer is lifting up the mind and the heart to God. What a beautiful definition. 
Prayer is the lifting up of the mind and the heart to God. So my friends were commenting upon Genesis chapter 17 in which God appears to Abraham and he talks to Abraham. And he says, I am the Almighty God. Walk in my presence. <clears throat> Another beautiful image of walking in my presence is a biblical passage that I love, and I think you do too. Walk in my presence is Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 is the last chapter of St. Luke. And the disciples are walking by themselves. Then Jesus comes to walk with them. At least the disciples on the road to Emmaus. What a beautiful passage. Maybe that passage can really touch you and strike you. So the disciples were walking by themselves. They were in desolation. They're in desolation. They're kind of like spiritual orphans. Forlorn. Seemed to be abandoned. Life seemed to have no meaning. They had no compass where, in which they could be directing their affections and their, their goals. But Jesus came to walk with them. Jesus wants to walk with you today. So does Mary. One of the most famous Marian songs in Spanish and Italian is Santa Maria del Camino. Our Lady of the Way, we want to invite Mary to be with us, to walk with us, to encourage us. So the verse continues, walk in my presence, and then God says to Ab Abraham what he's going to say to us, which is very challenging. He says, be blameless. Wow. What does that mean? Be blameless. Another word would be irreproachable. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Abraham, the patriarch, that holy man of God, blameless. Well, I really can't do that. Well, wait a minute. Maybe you can. You might be saying, well, Father, I can't because I've committed a lot of sins. Well, we're all sinners. You can be blameless. You can be blameless if you live out the gospel today. Because the gospel today from Matthew is very short. It's a gospel in which this leper, this man filled with leprosy approaches Jesus. And he says to Jesus, Lord, if you will, if you will, Lord, you can heal me. If you will, Lord, you can heal me. I really believe, Lord, if you will, you can heal me. Jesus moved. His heart is moved to compassion. He says to the leper, I he says to the leper, I do will it. Now, Jesus did something that no one would ever do. He's in front of a leper. Number one is that the leper would usually be in a leper colony separated from the rest of society. Furthermore, if a leper was let loose or you drew close to the leper, the leper was obliged to cry out impure. 
but for someone to touch a leper was unthought of. It was just, it was, it was unthinkable. And for many reasons, but I think one of the most obvious reasons that all of you know is that leprosy, which was very prevalent in the time of Jesus, in the time of St. Francis too, 1,200 years later, in the time of St. Damien, about 100 years ago, with Molokai, leprosy was an incurable disease But also leprosy, my friends, was a contagious disease. So I repeat, leprosy was an incurable disease. Is it you had it, then you're, you're stuck with it. Leprosy could be partial or total. Leprosy could eat away at the extremities of your body, your fingers, your toes, your nose, your vocal cords, your ears. And you end up looking kind of like a monster. But then you you could live the rest of your life with that physical defect, but it stopped right there. Full leprosy would basically be in which the leprosy is eating away at you, arriving at your inner organs, and eventually you die. So Jesus did something that was totally unthought of. He actually touched the leper. And instead of Jesus contracting the leprosy, which could happen, instead of him contracting the leprosy, this leper was healed, not gradually, by stages. But this leper was healed right away, immediately. Immediately he was healed. An immediate healing by Jesus, the divine physician. And these is, Jesus says, don't tell anyone about this, but to show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses prescribed. This will be a proof to them. So we're trying to connect the first reading to the gospel reading, which God says, be, walk in my presence and be blameless. Blameless. What happened to this leper? The leprosy that covered his body was totally cured. Now, the physical leprosy that we encounter in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament is symbolic of sin. Yes, I'll explain. What leprosy is to the body, the hands, the feet, the face, what leprosy is to the body, sin is to the soul. I repeat, what leprosy is to the body, sin is to the soul. So how can we be blameless? We might have some type of physical defect. Probably none of us, if we're older than 40, have a perfect, perfect health. However, we can be spiritually blameless. We can be freed of sin. So just as Jesus healed the leper in this passage today, We can be blameless 
We can walk in God's presence, be blameless through the contact of Jesus, who is the divine physician. Yes. Jesus, who is the divine physician. Jesus is the doctor. He's the doctor of our soul. How do we contact Jesus, the doctor? Very simply, through his mystical body. The mystical body of Jesus Christ, my friends, is the Catholic Church. And the channels of grace that heals that heal us come from the open wounds of Christ on the cross and his blood and water that gushed forth after his heart was pierced by the lance. So getting down to, to, to the concrete, every time we make a good confession, every time we make a good sacramental confession to the priest, who acts in persona Christi, he acts in the person of Christ, then Jesus, the divine physician, he washes us clean by his precious blood. We're renewed in our mind, in our heart, and in our soul. And as we read and meditate in the first chapter of Isaiah. Though your sins be as red as scarlet, I'll make them as white as the snow. So we can be, we can be blameless in the sight of God every time we approach Jesus as the leper did today with confidence. We approach Jesus as the leper and say, in the sacrament of confession, Lord, I am a sinner, but I'm repentant. Lord Jesus, I love you. Lord Jesus, heal me. Lord Jesus, I beg you to heal me. As you heal the leper of his leprosy, heal, I beg you, Lord, heal, Lord, the leprosy of my soul. And through sacramental confession, Jesus will stretch out his hand. He'll touch you, and he will truly heal you. So today, after my talk, if you just punch into the the, the readings for today and my article, you probably notice every, after every talk I give, there's posted an article that I've written and Mary Martyron has formatted. It's going to be in the Sacrament of Confession and how you can bring people, how you can become an apostle of confession, how you can bring people to the Divine Physician Jesus Christ through a good Sacrament of Confession. So, don't forget to log into my article, which is a means by which you can go deeper in your prayer experience. So rejoice in the infinite mercy of God, and let us try to put into practice the words from Genesis. I am God the Almighty. Walk in my presence and be blameless today. I'd like to give you my priestly blessing now. The Lord be with you. Through the intercession of Mary Most Holy, St. Joseph, the angels and the saints, may God bless all of you in a special way today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.